All right. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Can I get a good morning? All right. Amen. It's a beautiful day outside, a beautiful day to be in the Lord's house. Please stand and join us with who you say I am. Praise the name.
singing this morning. You may be seated. Good morning. morning. It's good to see you all here today. I want to welcome you to Berries Grove Baptist Church. I want to especially welcome our guests. We're glad that you are here today. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Our Father, we just thank you for this day that you have given us to gather together to praise your name because you are worthy of all of our honor and worship and praise. Lord, as we think about that day when Jesus will return, Lord, it is so hard for us to fathom what a glorious day that will be. And Lord, as we suffer uh, through the pain of this life, it seems like it is not coming nearly soon enough. Lord, we pray that you will strengthen our faith. Lord, that we would continue to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That we would trust in what you have promised you will do. And that that would sustain us through all of the daily troubles that we encounter. We pray that today you'll remind us of your goodness in this service as we sing praises to you, as we look into your word, may we remember the hope that we have in you. So we offer ourselves up to you during this time and pray that you would be pleased with our offering of praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're returning to Exodus. It's been a couple months since we've done that. Uh, So we're jumping back in where we left off. Remember, if you remember, back prior to December where we left off, the Israelites had just left Egypt, just crossed the Red Sea on dry ground as God parted the seas. And, and, And now we're, you know, we're only a few days later and they already forgot. They've already forgotten about the good things that God had done for them. And he's going to show his goodness to them in the passage we're going to look at today. And Eric's going to come and read uh, our New Testament passage out of John chapter 6, which is closely related to the passage that we'll be looking at today in Exodus 15 and 16. Um, Before he comes up, though, I want to make sure that you're aware that there is a handout in your bulletin. It's a ministry survey. And this is the product of a discussion that we had in our nominating committee meeting last Sunday night, as well as discussions that we've had on Wednesday night about how we can get more people in our congregation involved in ministry. And so we want to know how it is that God has gifted you and where you have a passion to serve. And so there are four areas that are listed on there. I want you to circle one to ten what your interest or gifting level is in each of those areas, and then give us some comments, especially about the ones that you do feel gifted and passionate about, about why. What makes you feel gifted or passionate in those areas? And I want you to fill it out. You know what? This will be, you know, if you get bored with my sermon, you can fill that out while I'm preaching today. Uh, Drop it in the offering plate on your way out. If you don't like to write, uh, uh, Brian Johnson will be putting it together this week on, um, on a Google uh, form, and so he's going to let you know when that is ready, and you can do it online then. But I hope that you'll fill it out. We want to get 100% participation. We want to begin to, uh, to just find out what each other's good at, because our church will never be effective until all of the parts of the body are functioning properly. So I hope you'll fill it out. I appreciate uh, you participating in that. All right. And I just want to say along those lines on the survey, the most important blank on there is the one that says name. (laughs) Make sure you put your name on it. This is not anonymous. So we need to know who you are in order to be able to plug you in into the area where you feel uh, gifted or, uh, or burdened, um, whichever the, the case may be. Now, to our New Testament reading. It's been a while, so buckle up. Um, 
We're in John chapter 6. And also, remember, Craig didn't preach last week, so he's got some built up too. So uh, it's no telling what we're in for this morning. But uh, we're going to be in John chapter 6, and we're going to begin in verse 30 and go through verse 51. And, uh, and I'll just say, Craig actually told me I could start earlier in the, the passage, and I kept it shorter than, uh, than it could have been, so I'm, I'm trying. Um, so beginning in verse 30, what sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you, they asked. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, Sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Therefore the Jews started grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who is listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly I tell you, Anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And... I forgot our uh, memory verse for this week comes from our our New Testament reading. It's uh, John 6, 35. So if you would, read that together with me now. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. All right, and I'm going to talk about that verse, but... I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time elsewhere first. This is a, a rich passage. There's a lot of theology here. There's a lot of, lot of doctrine here. Um, we, we look in it. I look at verse 37, 37. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. The one who is, is saved by Jesus, who has a relationship with him, he says, I will never cast out. That's eternal security. We cannot be snatched out of his hand. We cannot be taken away from him. If we are truly saved, we cannot lose that salvation. And then in verse 39, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. Uh, again, if we are his, then we are his indeed. Then we move down to, to verse 44. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So if we are truly his, we cannot be taken out of his hand. But we've got to realize that salvation, that that God's work of redemption in our lives is a work that he has done. It's not about us. If we come to him, it is because he has drawn us to himself. It's the pre-salvific work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, working in us to make us aware of him, to give us a burden for him, to draw us to him. 
That's how we are saved. It is God working in us so that we might be saved. Now, if you say, well, that, that frees me of responsibility because maybe I don't know him because he hadn't done a work to, to draw me to himself. Let's go a few more verses to verse 47. Truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. And I think of Romans 10, 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever calls. Verse 47, anyone who believes. So seek after him. Go after him. Look to, to believe. Look to know him. Right? And then I will tell you that you have done that because he has drawn you to himself. Right? We can't say that, well, it's a work of God, so I bear no responsibility. No, he says if you believe, if you call out to him, you will be saved. But you're doing that because he has worked in you in the first place. Right? Both things are happening at the same time. It, it's a complex thing for us to understand, and I don't know that we can understand it completely. But we've got to recognize that it is a work of God and, and something that we need to do, something that we need to pursue. We need to believe and we need to confess him as Lord and Savior. So there's your, your theology, your, your doctrine in this passage, and there's more of it there, but I just want to, to hit on that because it is, is so evident, so clear in this passage that we have this morning. Now, back to our memory verse. Verse 35, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. You know, when I, when I read that, I think about the, the sufficiency of, of Christ. He is our provision and he is all sufficient. No one will ever be hungry. No one will ever be, be thirsty again. But I, I read that and I think about we, we hunger and thirst after so many other things, right? Are, are we really satisfied in him? Are we really contented in him? You know, we, we talked about it on Wednesday night. We talked about it in our experience in God's study. I, I just think about where, where he asked, do, do we love Jesus? Do we really love Jesus? Do we really have that relationship with him? And, and if we really do, then we can taste and see that the Lord is good. We can be satisfied. We can be contented in him. If we really love him, we really know him, we really find that sufficiency in him and stop chasing after fulfillment in all these other areas. One commentator said it this way, he said, I wonder if the reason so many Christians feel bored and restless is that their lives are spent pursuing that which cannot satisfy. Another promotion at work, another vacation away, another sports victory, or another fancy meal. That one's me. Jesus is the bread of life. His is the only one who can feel the emptiness inside of us. A full life is a life spent in pursuit of Jesus. A life spent any other way will feel barren and unfulfilled. How do you feel this morning? Do you feel like you're still chasing, still unfulfilled? Or do you feel like you are satisfied in him? Pursue him. Know him. Feel your hunger. Feel your thirst with him. The same commentator goes on to say, that which we think gives our lives so much meaning is never quite enough. We always need more, but even more won't do it. We think when this event happens or this goal is achieved or we reach that milestone, then finally life will be worth living. But even those who reach their goals still die. Jesus says he is the bread of life. If we have the bread of life, we have life eternal, life that is, is full We've got to, to know him in that way. We've got to know him fully and have that love relationship with him. Augustine said, you made us for yourself and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. Another way to look at that might be to say, you made us to hunger for yourself. You made us to hunger for the bread of life. He has put that longing within us and he can satisfy. He is the only one who can satisfy that longing. I pray that you are satisfied in him this morning. So as we go into this time of prayer, I want us to pray about, are, are we satisfied in him? 
Have we tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Or are we hungering and thirsting after other things and chasing after things that will not fulfill us, that will not satisfy us this morning? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you praising you and thanking you this morning for who you are. God, I I thank you that, Lord, if we are yours, we cannot be snatched out of your hand. I thank you for the work of salvation that you have done in my life and so many lives, Lord, drawing people to yourself. Lord, all the praise and glory belongs to you for my salvation. Lord, it is not my work, but your work. And Lord... I thank you that Jesus is the bread of life. I thank you that he completely satisfies all hunger and thirst. Lord, forgive me, forgive us for chasing after other things that that will not satisfy. Lord, help me to see the futility in that. Lord, help me to love you. Help me to know you more and be satisfied in you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us with our theme song of the month, Battle Belongs.
guidance, and we can't, we don't have to depend on our own strength. We'd be in trouble, right? Let's continue with, yet not I, but, but through Christ in me. Yeah. 
Thank you, praise team. Appreciate that. You know, I've noticed that the older I get, the more I forget. Anybody relate? Um, you know, remembering people's names has always been something that I've been good at. Uh, but that's become a lot more difficult, especially if I haven't seen the person in a while. So if I forget your name, don't be mad at me. It just means you need to come to church more. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's Paul. Is that right? All right, yeah. <laughs> You know, even more than names, though, I think what bothers me the most is I tend to forget what I did yesterday. Y'all have that problem? I mean, people will come up and they'll say, well, how's your week been? And I just give them that blank stare and I go, I don't know. I guess it was good. I don't really remember. I mean, I was all right. But I can remember in clear detail things that happened in my childhood, ball games that happened in the far, far past. You know, it's just amazing how strange of an organ the brain is. The weird way that it works. And it only gets stranger the older that you get. I hope your memory is better than mine. I really do. Um, but I'm afraid we all have one form of short-term memory loss in common. We forget the good things that God has done for us when bad things start to happen. You have that problem? We all do. We all do. When it happens, we start to blame him for all of our troubles rather than remembering that he's been faithful to us in the past so we know that he's going to be faithful to us in the present. And understand something, this is not a modern day issue only. It's not as though we can't remember the good things God has done because of environmental issues like microwaves or plastics. Because we're going to see in Exodus 15 and 16 today that long before microwaves and plastics, they couldn't remember what God had done either. They forgot very, very quickly. It's really ugly here, though, because what we see is that only a few days after they crossed the Red Sea, they were already mad. They were wanting to go back to where they came from as though Egypt was a holiday resort. Not that they had been enslaved there for 400 years. But when I look at them, I get a clear picture of myself. And I think you will too. Are you struggling with short-term memory loss of God's goodness to you? Are you bitter about where your life is right now? Have you forgotten the great things that God has done for you? Maybe God is using the trials in your life to show you what is wrong with you rather than what is wrong with Him. You see, we're always looking to blame. Maybe the blame lies within. Well, we're going to read, starting in verse 22 of Exodus 15, and we're going to read through verse 15 of chapter 16. So let's start. Then Moses led Israel on from the Red Sea, and they went out to the wilderness of Shur. They journeyed for three days in the wilderness without finding water. They came to Marah, but they could not drink the water at Marah because it was bitter. That is why it was named Marah. The people grumbled to Moses, what are we going to drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he threw it into the water, the water became drinkable. The Lord made a statute and ordinance for them at Marah, and he tested them there. He said, if you will carefully obey the Lord your God... Do what is right in his sight. Pay attention to his commands and keep all his statutes. I will not inflict any illnesses on you that I inflicted on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs and twenty date palms, and they camped there by the water. The entire Israelite community departed from Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. The entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Instead, you brought us into the wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. The people are going are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. This way I will test them to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, This evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the Lord's glory before he has heard your compl- because he has heard your complaints about him. For who are we that you complain about us? Moses continued, The Lord will give you meat to eat this evening and all the bread you want in the morning, for he has heard the complaints that you are raising against him. Who are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. As Aaron was speaking to the entire Israelite community, they turned toward the wilderness, and there in a cloud the Lord's glory appeared. The Lord spoke to Moses, I have heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will eat bread until you are full. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. So at evening, a quail came and covered the camp. In the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew evaporated, there were fine flakes on the desert surface, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, what is it? because they didn't know what it was. Moses told them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Let us pray. Lord, as we look into your word, Lord, it is not hard to see the reflection of ourselves. Lord, forgive us for our own lack of faith, our own ingratitude, our own self-centeredness. Forgive us for forgetting what you have done because we're too busy complaining about what we want. Lord, help us to trust you today, to see that you are good and faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. In this passage, we see that God uses trials to test us to reveal truth to us. The first way we see this is that God tests us to reveal who we really are. Who we really are. Now, the Israelites began their journey toward the Promised Land through an area on the northern border of Egypt. They'd only gone about 40 miles. It was about a three-day journey from the Red Sea to where this incident occurred. So literally, less than a week Less than a week after they saw God part the Red Sea, they come to this place called Mara, and they couldn't find water. Now, that's not really surprising when you're in the desert, right? Some translations call it the wilderness, some call it the desert. It's a really dry region with some scrubby plant life, not a whole lot of water. And so it's not surprising that they couldn't find water, especially when you have over a million people who are thirsty. Now, we can assume that they had brought some water with them when they left Egypt, but we would also assume that those supplies were becoming depleted. They were naturally becoming worried. But it had only been three days, three days, since they saw God do a great miracle. Well, they finally stumble upon some water, and it was bitter. The word mara means bitter. And it probably refers to the fact that the water, much of it in that region, would have been salty or brackish, okay, undrinkable and not healthy. But one thing's for sure, bitter speaks of their attitude, doesn't it? They were bitter people. They were bitter people, and they were expressing their bitterness. Rather than crying out to God for help, who had already performed so many miracles for them to get to this point, they instead began to claim to complain to Moses. And why not? Moses just represented God anyway. So we'll just complain to Moses. We'll complain about Moses. And to Moses' credit, he immediately turns to God and cries out to God to do something. And God instructed him on what to do. It says that God showed him a tree. The word showed there is the word from which we get Torah, which is the word for the law, the instruction that God gave to the Israelites to show them how to live. So he used this tree as an instruction for Moses and the people. Now, 
People have tried to figure out how a tree can make water drinkable. Uh, I don't think that's the point of the story, right? The point of the story is God did a miracle. He used the tree to show them that he would provide for their needs. That's what he was showing them. He was instructing them on the fact that he was trustworthy. But much like us, Though they had seen the great things that he could do, they still didn't trust him to take care of them. Now, the next statement is really important, okay? It says, the Lord made a statute and ordinance for them at Marah, and he tested them there. So God pronounces a covenant with his people right here. It's, you know, there, there, there are quite a few covenants in the Old Testament, some more prominent than others, and this is not one that we often think of as being a primary covenant, but it is a covenant because he made a statute and he made an ordinance. And it was for the purpose of testing them. He says, if you will carefully obey the Lord your God, do what is right in his sight, pay attention to his commands, keep all statutes, I will not inflict the illnesses on you that I inflicted on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now, they certainly would have made the connection with one of the plagues in Egypt. Because what was the first plague? He turned the water in the Nile into blood so that they couldn't drink the water. So naturally, God is trying to make, get them to make that connection. Oh, we don't want to be like the Egyptians. We don't want to experience the plagues of God, so we need to believe in him. We need to trust Him. We need to be obedient to Him. Now, it is interesting that He says that He did this to test them. Test them. That's the same word that is used when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Understand something, it was, it always has been, and it always will be obedience that separates God's people from everyone else. That is the one distinction that God expects and demands from his people is obedience. Now, we know that that translates through his supernatural sanctifying work in our lives. That translates to holiness. We are set apart, and we're set apart for him out of our obedience to him. So he gives them this test, and the test was to see would they remain loyal and obedient to God after all he had done for them, or would they instead turn on him at the slightest inconvenience? Are we like that? Do we turn on God at the slightest inconvenience when things don't go just exactly the way that we want them to? Do we turn on God and begin to doubt Him and to become disobedient to Him? Now this was only the first of many tests that God was going to give the Israelites so that He could expose the state of their hearts. But it's interesting that even though He was testing them, He had already shown grace to them. He already had shown grace because, well, for one thing, he'd already given them water to drink, right? The next thing that happens is they end up in a place called Elam, which was a short distance away, where there were 12 springs and 70 date palms. And they camped there for at least a few weeks, according to what we see between there and the next passage. So God took them to a place where they could find refreshment, where they could renew their strength. You know, it just makes me think how incredibly patient he is with us. Think about all the times that you've doubted the goodness of God, that you have complained about what He hasn't done for you rather than thanking Him for what He has done for you and the fact that God continues to put up with our junk. It's pretty impressive when you think about it. He's a good God. But let's not think that God isn't already aware of what's in our hearts. God knows what's in your heart and God knows what's in my heart. He doesn't need to test us to figure it out. Psalm 11.4 says, The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord, His throne is in heaven. His eyes watch. His gaze examines everyone. God knows exactly what's on your heart and mind today just like He does mine. He doesn't need us to prove anything to Him because He already knows who we are and what we're going to do. But you know who doesn't know? Us. We don't know. We don't understand the depth of our own sin. We can't see just how corrupt we are and how much we need His help to change. 
The tests we receive through trials are so we can get a glimpse of who we are on the inside. Philip Ryken said, Going through the wilderness was not necessary for Israel's salvation. He'd already saved them. He'd already brought them out of Egypt. But it was necessary for their sanctification. Think about that. God saves you before all your sin is taken away, right? While you're still in your mess. That's when God saves you. Jesus' blood covers your sin. The blood he shed on the cross pays for your sin. But that doesn't mean you're no longer a sinner. In fact, the rest of your life is the process of God getting that sin out of your life. And how does he do that? By gradually over time revealing to us where the sin is in our lives that needs to be changed. And that's what he was doing in the lives of the Israelites in the wilderness. You know, think about this. Trials are necessary to do this because when life is sailing along, we don't think about the mess, do we? We don't think about the mess. We don't don't have to deal with the pride and the self-centeredness and the ingratitude that is in us because we're smooth sailing. Everything is peaches and cream. And we're just rolling along through life. And then there's a bump in the road, and all of a sudden we're forced to deal with the mess that we've had pushed down inside of us for so long while things were good. God allows that stuff to bubble up during times of trial and testing. And at this point, we can either acknowledge our sin, confess it to God, and repent, yielding to His will, or we can grumble and complain, and we can become bitter and angry and resentful toward God and everyone else. And you know people like that, don't you? Sure you do. We all do. We know bitter and angry and resentful people who are never happy, no matter what good thing might come their way in life. They've turned inward on themselves. But God doesn't want that for us. God wants us to get it out. He wants us to get it out. I love Philippians 2, 12 through 15. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. No, you're not saved by works, but you have to work out what salvation means in your life. Because remember, salvation is a three-step process. Justification where you're made right with God, sanctification, where sin is being expunged from your life, and glorification, where you enter into the presence of God and you are perfect. So we're in the long process of sanctification. We're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. It's a scary thing to deal with the mess that's inside of you. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. There's the good news. You're not doing this on your own. You're not doing this on your own. God is involved in the process when you open your life up to him. But then look at the very next verse, the connection. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. Now, isn't that strange that grumbling and arguing is connected with working out our salvation with fear and trembling? You see, it's just our natural tendency not to want to put in the work. And then we grumble and complain and we argue with other people who might not see things the way that we do. And we don't finish the process. And we never distinguish ourselves as children of God in a world that is dark. You know... So many of us have been living with this junk down inside of our lives for so long, we don't pay any attention to it. We get comfortable with it. We get comfortable with it. And when our comfort is disturbed, we naturally will complain. We'll complain about other people, and we'll complain about God. We see that clearly in the next account in chapter 16. took place only a month after the Exodus. He says that they departed from Elam, uh, and, and came to the wilderness of sin on the 15th day of the second month. So it's exactly one month after they left Egypt. One month. So the first incident was three days after they crossed the Red Sea. Now we're one month out from when they left Egypt. Wilderness of sin sounds appropriate for what's going to happen here, but that's not the actual word for sin. It's just a Hebrew transliteration. It doesn't mean sin. Um, but boy, they, they're going to show their sin while they're there. 
So they've just come from their little, you know, vacation getaway there in Elam where everything was good, and, and then they, they, they traveled just a short distance away, and they started complaining again. They started complaining again. Now, they directed their grumbling at Moses and Aaron, but the wording makes it clear that they were really mad at God. Look at what it says. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the wilderness, or in the land of Egypt. If only we had died by the Lord's hand. If only God had just killed us there, we'd have been better off than we are now. <laughs> if only he had left us alone because life was so good in Egypt. Never mind the fact that we were crying out to God for help because the burden of our slavery was so heavy. It was better than this. I love what Walter Kaiser said. He says, suddenly Egypt seemed all peaches and cream, actually pots of meat and all you can eat rather than bondage and slave drivers. I mean, they literally say, oh, when we were in Egypt, we sat beside pots of meat and had all the bread we wanted. And now we're going to die of hunger out here in the wilderness. <laughs> hunger had revealed their selfish ingratitude and their resentful spirits. They weren't thankful for being set free, even though they had cried out for God to set them free. As far as they were concerned, they were better off dead. And it was God's fault that they were in the predicament they were in. Moses and Aaron were just collateral damage. They're their anger was focused on God. You know, someone made an interesting observation about this. They said, ingratitude denotes spiritual immaturity. Infants do not always appreciate what parents do for them. They have short memories. Their concern is not what you did for me yesterday, but what are you doing for me today? The past is meaningless, and so is the future. They live for the present. That's true about babies. It's also true about grown-ups. We live for the present, don't we? We forget about the past. We don't care about the future. All we care about is what I want right now. What I want right now. You know, God had already proven his faithfulness over and over and over to them by sending the plagues and parting the Red Sea, and then he provided the clean water, and then he gave them a place to go where there was plenty of water. But what was he doing for them now? What have you done for me lately, God? You're not doing anything. We don't ever act like that, do we? You ever act like that? You ever think like that? We probably wouldn't admit it. But in our hearts, I believe that's the way we are. We have short memories. We forget what God did for us yesterday because our bellies are empty today. But the problems that we face in this life force us to reckon with our self-centered state and call it what it is, sin. Because that's what it is. It is sin, and it is eating us alive. And only when we come to terms with our sin can we truly begin to, to change and can we truly begin to enjoy life in relationship with God rather than constantly be worrying what is going to happen next and then becoming angry when it does. Tony Morita posed this question. He said, is your first reaction to trouble faith-filled prayer or grumbling and anxiety? That's a very good question for us to think about. Is your first reaction to trouble faith-filled prayer or grumbling and anxiety? Because that says a whole lot about our relationship with God. Marita goes on to say that worry, uh, worrying is just functional atheism, which I thought was a good description. Functional atheism. Are you living as a functional atheist today? You claim to believe in God. You go through life talking about Him. But in reality, you don't really have faith. You're just putting on a show. What is God trying to reveal to you today about the trials that you've been going through? Can you see who you really are. Second, God tests us to reveal what we really believe, right? So he's been showing us who we really are, and now he's going to show us what we really believe. God didn't waste any time in responding to this bunch of belly aching people, and he tells Moses, tell him I'm going to rain bread from heaven on them. Now the word for bread there is literally food, 
So it could have referred to both the quail and what would become known as manna. Now, the point that he was making was that there would be no mistaking on their part that the food they received was miraculous. That they would have to admit God gave them that food. Now, the quail would be a singular occurrence, and that is the, all these quail coming up from the south is not that shocking uh, because of migration patterns in that area of the world and all that stuff. And it only happened that one time. But the manna was there every morning for 40 years. Every morning for 40 years they get up, except on the sixth day. I mean, except on the seventh day. It was there on the sixth day, and they could get twice as much. But for 40 years, six days a week, there was manna on the ground every morning when they woke up. And then when they entered the promised land, it stopped. Clearly, it was an act of God that they could not deny. Now, he says here that he was going to do this again to test them. There's that word again in verse 4. Because he starts giving instructions about what they're supposed to do. Uh, I want them to go out each day and gather what they're going to eat for that day. And then on the sixth day, they need to gather enough for two days because I don't want them picking up food on the Sabbath day. And so he says, this is a test to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. It's a test of obedience, right? It's a test of obedience in regard to gathering. But if you go on to read the rest of the chapter later, you'll see that there were some who failed to heed the simple instructions of don't go out on the Sabbath looking for manna uh, and, and, or trying to keep it overnight because then it went bad. But here's the point of this test. The point of this test was to reveal whether they trusted God to provide for their daily needs. Because they couldn't keep it overnight or it would rot and it would start having worms in it. They couldn't go out on the Sabbath and get it because that was the day they were supposed to be worshiping God. So they had to get twice as much on the day before. All of this pointed to the fact that they were completely dependent on God's gracious provision. And so it tested them to see whether they really believed that or not. Could they trust him to give them their food every day? Now, there is a definite connection between that and the model prayer that Jesus gives us in Matthew 6. Real simple. Give us today our daily bread. You ever reflected on that? Give us today our daily bread. And the wording literally means give us the amount of bread we need for today. Right? One day. Now, we live in a different world from them, don't we? Especially from the people in the time of Jesus, whom he was talking to. We live in a day of abundance, right? We stock our refrigerators, our freezers, our pantries. We have no concept of what it means to depend on God to provide for our needs on a day-to-day basis. We just sail through life thinking that we should always have more than enough And if we start to run low, we have to run to the store. And all we have to do is look back at the pandemic to understand this is true. Remember when people were hoarding toilet paper like it was gold? That's right. Some of you are hanging your head. You know, got to get that toilet paper, man. There might not ever be any more. How did people survive before toilet paper? I don't know. We'll have to figure that one out later. But you got to understand, he was teaching them to be completely dependent on him. Completely dependent on him. Now, the question is, are we completely dependent on him to the point that we would be willing to trust him to give us what we need each day rather than thinking we need to store it up for ourselves? That's something to consider. I love what J.C. Ryle said, the old Anglican bishop from the 19th century. He said, trials are intended to make us think, to wean us from the world, to send us to the Bible, to bring us to our knees. You know, when you go through difficult times and you realize the only hope I have is to depend on God, that is the moment that you discover what you really believe. What you really believe. Are we on our knees trusting God? 
Moses brought the people out. He told them to look to the wilderness. And there God appeared to them in a cloud with all of His glory. His glory was so great it had to be shrouded by the cloud or they would have died because they weren't holy. They were sinful people. And so His presence was shrouded by the cloud, but they could still see His glory. And He told them, uh, He told Moses to tell them the quail were coming in the evening and then the bread would come in the morning. Now, when we get to the bread, the, the manna as it would come to be called in verse 31, it says it was like fine flakes on the ground. <clears throat> so when the dew would dissipate, the manna would be left and they would go out and they would gather it. And it would last for 40 years, as we've already talked about. The name for manna comes from what we see in verse 15. When the, when the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, what is it? The word manna, as verse 31 tells us, is literally the word that means what? They picked it up and they went, what is it? And so that's what they called it. What? It's a pretty good name, right? If you don't know what it is, just call it what? What? And you know what? Nobody ever has to call it that again because there's no more of it around. It's gone. It's not necessary anymore. Manna is not needed, but it was needed to teach them dependence on God. Now let's take a look back at what the Lord told Moses. The purpose was for giving them the quail and the manna in verse 12. He says, then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Don't ever mistake God's purpose in everything that He does is to help you come to an understanding of who He is and why He's worthy of your trust. Every single event that takes place in your life. You know, we love to read Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good, right? Well, they do all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose to all those that are being conformed to the image of His Son, Right? God is using everything in our lives to squeeze out the sin so that we begin to look more like the Son. That's the key. That's what He's doing in our lives. And so He's trying to teach them who He is through this test in the wilderness. Did they believe that God was who He said He was and that He would do what He said He would do? And that's the same question we need to ask in our own lives. Do we believe? What we read in here, man, we say we believe the Bible, but there's a whole lot of the Bible I bet you had not read because some of it's hard. Some of it's hard to say, yeah, I really believe that. I mean, I'm really committed to that truth. You know, it's reflected in my life. That's a, that's a lot because there's some things in here that are hard. They're hard. Can I really trust God when everything seems to be falling apart? I mean, it's not going to be much longer. They're going to get sick of eating that manna, and they're going to start complaining about that. They weren't even thankful for what God gave them to sustain their lives because they cared more about themselves than they cared about Him. They didn't really believe Him. They didn't want to understand who He was. They just wanted Him to meet their needs. You know, it's interesting Moses brings out the purpose of the manna in Deuteronomy 8. He says, remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your ancestors had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of of the Lord. And we'll see that verse again in a few minutes when I want to look at a different passage. But isn't that something? He says the manna wasn't just to keep your bellies full. The manna had a sanctifying effect in your life because every time you ate it, you were declaring your faith in God's provision for your life. And you were depending on Him for your life. And you began to understand that that manna came because God commanded it. So really I'm dependent on the Word of God that comes from God. Right? Now I want you to think about who the true Word of God is. I mean, doesn't John 1.1 say that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God? That's Jesus. He is the Word. He is the living expression of God's truth. 
And you know, when we get to that passage that Eric just read, in John 6, we come to verses 47 through 41, and I appreciate you not taking all that good stuff from me. You only touched on one verse. He says there, Truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. And he says, I am the bread of life. So manna was the bread of life to those Israelites in the wilderness. Okay? But it wasn't just sustaining them physically. What they didn't understand, it was connecting them to God spiritually as they depended on Him each day. He says, your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. They all died. Every single one of them died. He said, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And you know, going back to what Eric read earlier, that this, whole, this whole challenge started because he had just fed 5,000 people with five you know, dinner rolls and a couple small fish, and now they wanted more. You know, because, well... Well, you know, Jesus, you, you need to prove that this is, this is something that's sustainable because, I mean, you know, Moses gave manna for 40 years and, you know, one meal from you is not going to cut it. We need to see a little bit more. <laughs> and so Jesus says, yeah, that manna was so good they all died. Remember? That manna, first of all, he says, Moses didn't give it to you, God did. Second of all, the manna was not meant to sustain people for eternity. He says, I am. I'm the one who sustains people for eternity. He says that I am the bread of life that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. Now, we know that Jesus was not referring to people eating his flesh. That was not the point of what he was saying. No, what he's saying is that we would believe in him. Anyone who believes has eternal life. He says, I'm going to give my flesh. That's the bread. I'm going to give my flesh for the life of the world. He was talking about when he went to the cross. And we're called to believe in what he did for us. And that bread will sustain us, not just through this world, but forever. That's the point that Jesus was trying to make to them. So when we connect the dots with Exodus 16 and Deuteronomy 8, we see that the manna that God gave them was so that they would know He was the Lord. It was meant to teach them to trust in His Word that He promised it would come every day. And Jesus was the living expression of God's Word in whom we can trust to give us life, not only for today, but forever. He's the extension of that manna in so much of a greater way. But you know, Jesus didn't just speak God's word, which gives life. He endured temptation, and he defeated it so we could have eternal life, even though we have failed the test. Because guess what? They failed every one of the tests that they were given in the wilderness. But Jesus didn't. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And he answered, and here's that verse from Deuteronomy, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's no surprise that Jesus went out into the desert, into the wilderness where the Israelites had been, to be tempted for 40 days, just like the Israelites were tested for 40 years. And where they failed, and all of that original generation died in the wilderness and never made it to the promised land, Jesus passed the test. He was dependent on His Father, and ultimately we must be dependent on Him. Sure, He could have made stones bread. But that would have been at the violation of his father's word. And he was more concerned with his father's word than he was human bread. Because he knew that eternal life is what matters, not temporary life. Now here's the thing I want you to understand. Jesus didn't just do that so that we could follow his example. Understand, Jesus does give us an example to follow in those temptations because every time he's tempted, what does he do? He quotes scripture. And that, that is the answer for us. But the point is not that we're to follow His example. The point is that we're to trust in His victory. 
Because understand is that the more you try, the more you will fail if you try to do these things on your own. The point is, Jesus already passed the test. And because He passed the test, you can trust in Him. And by faith in Him, you will be saved. Not because you did anything, because He already did it for you. Folks, that's the hope that we have. You know, I think about Tim Bowes. He likes to say, you just need to buck up and ruck up. Well, I'm going to tell you something. No offense to Tim. Bucking up and rucking up is the fastest way to destroy your life. You need to place your faith in Jesus alone. And I don't mean the one time. I don't mean just when you pray that prayer. I mean every day. Every day you wake up in the morning, you acknowledge, I cannot pass the test today, but Jesus did. And because He did, I can trust in Him to give me the strength to die to self and live to Him. To let go of my needs, wants, and desires and to trust in His provision for my life. Folks, trials force us to think about what we really believe about God. Man, I'm telling you, it's easy to talk about God in the hypothetical when everything is okay. And all you got to do is come to church and put on a smiley face and then go home and do whatever you want. Man, when trouble comes, that's when you find out the rubber meets the road in regard to faith. And that's when we realize we have to die to self if we're going to survive. Because only in Him can we find life. And I'm here to tell you, dying to self is a painful process. I don't know anybody that wants to do it. It's a painful process. Because we are so comfortable with these things that we've built up in our lives that to have them ripped away from us hurts. Do you know what's interesting? I was wrapping up the sermon yesterday morning, and I happened to look at my phone, and I had a notification that Haley uh, Rich had posted something. And it so summed it up. It summed it up so well, I thought, I got a quote her. So she gets a quote in today's sermon. The true gospel-filled life is one of dying to self. It is one of sacrifice. It is one of saying no to the world so you can say yes to Jesus. Oh, but the freedom, the peace, and the fulfillment that comes and is to come with the life as a new creation, the glory that is yet to be seen, well, that makes it all worth it. That brings a hope that endures through all circumstances. I hope that you will consider what that says. Because it's an amazing thing to think about. I mean, yeah, dying to self is going to hurt, and you're not going to enjoy it. But at the end of the day, it is the only thing that provides hope in the midst of everything that you're going through. And it's the only thing that's going to get you through to the end. Dying to self. But we don't like to die. And we'll do everything to not die. Folks, what is your hope based on today? Is your hope based on the fact, the hope that God is going to keep your family healthy? They're all going to die. Sorry to disappoint you. Is your hope based on staying in a really nice house and having a really good job and driving a really nice car and always being successful in everything you do? It's all going to be taken away. Is your hope just based on uh, how far you make it in this world and fame and fortune? It's all going to go away. Folks, if our hope is not based in Christ, then we don't have hope. We don't have real hope. So I want to ask you, is your hope in the things of this world, which will always disappoint you in the end, or is your hope in Jesus, which promises an eternity of satisfaction? You know, I told Eric he should have quoted John Piper in his uh, earlier part, so I'll do it now because I love the juxtaposition of... um, our satisfaction in God and His glory. John Piper said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. If you want to glorify God in your life, be satisfied with Him. You know, I love it when he says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that no matter what situation you're in, no matter how much you've lost, that God's grace is sufficient for you and you can be satisfied in Him? That's the only path to glorifying Him. You know, last week we sang, 
part of the hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. I think its lyrics are worth repeating here. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise and to know, thus saith the Lord. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him, o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Folks, have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? You're never going to understand anything I've talked about until you start there. Have you trusted him as your Lord and Savior? Have you recognized that you don't have any hope of life beyond this world apart from him? Any hope of true joy in this life right now apart from him? Folks, if God is speaking to your heart, I invite you to come and receive him as your Lord and Savior. To come and become a part of his family as he adopts you in. Are you resting on his promises today? This is for people who are already saved. Right? It's real easy to believe and follow for a while, but are you resting on his promises each and every day, no matter what is going on in your life? Do you need grace to trust him more? Folks, I invite you today to confess your sins of doubt, ingratitude, pride, self-centeredness, bitterness, Confess all that today and let him wrap you in his grace and mercy and love. You know, our great hope is that he is faithful when we're not. He'll be faithful today if you call out to him. Let us pray. Father, we confess that we are easily turned away from you, easily embittered, easily resentful. Lord, that at the slightest threat to our own comfort, Lord, we will tuck tail and run to try and restore that comfort. Even when you're telling us it's not what's best for us. Lord, I pray that if you are working on somebody's heart today, that they would yield to you, that they would surrender to you, that they would run to you and find peace and hope and life in Christ. Lord, for all of us who are here today that are struggling with sin, with pride and self-centeredness and ingratitude and all the other things that come attached to those, Lord, we ask that you would cleanse us, change us, root us in you today. Help us to see who we are and what we really believe and help us to run to you for cleansing and for strength. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Please stand and join us. What a glorious day it will be when we all get to heaven, amen.
got a few announcements before you leave today. Uh, this afternoon at 5 o'clock, uh, we'll have youth and team kid. Uh, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, Helping Hands group will meet in the Family Life Center social room. Wednesday night at 7, we'll be meeting for prayer and seeking to uh, seeking God's will for where we're going in ministry uh, at Berries Grove. Uh, Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning is the men's breakfast. Guys, I hope you'll come out and join us for that. And then at 5.30 on Saturday is the children's winter party. Tomorrow is the deadline to sign your kids up for that. So uh, just talk to Liam before you leave and go ahead and sign up today. Don't forget the ministry surveys. I hope you filled it out. I hope you'll drop it in an offer plate. If not, take it home, fill it out, bring it back next week and drop it in. Or be looking for an email this week that you can do it online. God is good. All the time. All the time. Have a blessed day.